Welcome to another episode of Junior Achievement of South Florida's Recipe for Success. Just as there are no two recipes that contain the exact same ingredients or measurements, there are no two success stories exactly the same. Recipe for Success features entrepreneurs, visionary leaders, and innovators of all ages who will share the ingredients that make them successful. Here's your host, Lori Salarulo, President and CEO of Junior Achievement of South Florida. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of JA's Recipe for Success. I'm your host, Lori Salarulo, and I'm the President and CEO of Junior Achievement of South Florida. Um, today's show, uh, our guest is someone that I've known through the community for many, many years. Don't want to say too many, because then I'll give away our ages, but... Um, and her and I like to lie a little bit about that. But um, I think that um, as a, a woman leader in our community, it's someone that I have looked up to uh, who has been a, an inspiration for me uh, to watch her grow and to watch her uh, just uh, do amazing things in our community and in our state. Our guest today is Stacy Ritter, who is the president and CEO of the Greater Fort Lauderdale Convention and Visitors Bureau. And I am going to bring my friend Stacy in. Well, hello there. Hello, how are you? I am great. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and to join us and share your ingredients to success. My pleasure. So, yeah. so how, how are you? I always ask that first. Fine, I guess, is, uh, is the best way I can describe how I am. Um, I have good days. I have not so good days. Um, I have days where things are going really, really well and and things where obviously they're not. But I, I will tell you that um, I'm just, I've, I'm grateful every day that mm. I'm breathing, that I can breathe and that I'm employed and I can put food on my table and I feel deeply for those people who can't right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I think that is something you're right, uh, that we are so blessed, some of us, and so I think in positions like yours and mine, the fact that we get to help the community um, is so important. Uh, and I know that it makes me feel better uh, about that. But I think for those watching, can you share a little bit about um, what the Convention and Visitors Bureau does and, and, and the role that it plays right in our community and our county? Um, the Convention and Visitors Bureau's job is to bring, to market and promote Greater Fort Lauderdale to bring visitors in. Uh, we have on average 14 and a half million visitors who come every year, both nationally and internationally, to Greater Fort Lauderdale, Broward County. And um, that's our job. We market and promote across the country and across the world, whether it's for leisure travelers, people who are on vacation, or people who, who want to come for their conferences, their associations, or their group meetings. And we work 365 days a year. Uh, seven days a week to make sure that we can bring those people here because in Broward County alone, 180,000 people are either directly or were directly or indirectly employed through tourism. It's our number one industry here in Broward County. And without it, as we've seen, the economy stalls. So we feel a great deal of responsibility to make sure those visitors come to keep people, to keep our residents employed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I can't, that is the industry probably that has taken the biggest hit here in South Florida for sure, uh, because it is one of our, our top industries. But um, you are also involved from a, from a national level. And so what's, what is the, the, the buzz? What, is, what are people talking about? Is everybody suffering and going through what we're going through? Uh, yes, across the country, people um, in my, my colleagues, we talk about it a lot, we're on we, we were in the beginning on weekly CEO calls for um, CBBs. Now it's not as often as it used to be, but um, there's no question whether it's losing staff, losing budget, um, having, we, we all know someone who's lost a job through this. I mean, in Broward County, half of the um, hospitality industry workers have lost their jobs. So it's a, and I guess there is some comfort in knowing that we are all in this together, that we're all feeling the pain together, that no one destination is achieving when the rest are not. But that doesn't really, at the end of the day, help put people's, put, put, help people feed their families, which is really what we do. We help people be able to pay their bills by making sure that the tourism industry is vibrant and, and relevant here. Yeah. And under normal circumstances, you all are, are doing an amazing job um, 
uh, getting uh, the people down here and, and to to you know spend money in our county and all that. You know, what's I, I think about the plan and now and now I think we've taken a little bit of a turn. So I think maybe you had you know, I, I said to somebody this morning that they asked how I was and I said, I'm exhausted. I'm hopeful, but I'm exhausted. And just when you think you have the plan to move forward, right? Something happens and it's I just feel like, you know, I know everybody's using that word pivot. But that's all we keep doing is pivoting. Um, so now we've seen some changes, right, over the last couple of weeks and the numbers rising. Have, obviously, I'm assuming that has changed some of the plans that you had in place to reopen and re-energize. It, it did. We uh, About a month ago, we, we put out a, a video summit. It was about 40 minutes long talking about a recovery, a recovery plan as we entered phase one of reopening. And we were all very hopeful that we were going to start to climb out of this hole. We, we knew it was going to be a long, it's going to be a long recovery. Uh, right. We feel that until there's a vaccine or a therapeutic or therapeutics, people aren't going to travel like they like they have in the past. They're not going to go far distance. Drive traffic was really where we were, what we were looking for. People who were willing to drive five, six, seven hours um, and get away, because I think we all want to get away. But, um, and two weeks ago, we had occupancy over 50% in our hotels for the first time in three months. Wow. I'm pretty sure that last weekend that probably dropped in by half because of the fact that the numbers are increasing. And the truth of the matter is, we became complacent. It's I, I, I heard on T, I don't remember who, which commentator, but in Europe, the conversation is, oh, it looks like America's just given up. And it felt like as we were reopening, we're like, okay, we're over it, everything's fine, we're all gonna go back and do our, our what we used to do. And it's just not like that. This virus is highly contagious, it doesn't care who you are. Um, and we lost, well, I think we, we let our guard down here in Broward County, I think we let our guard down a little too much. Yeah. And as a result, we're seeing, we are reevaluating our recovery. Summer deals are huge for us. Summer market is always slower, but it's always less expensive as well. Uh, we thought, you know, six months ago, we were planning for a really vibrant and healthy summer season. Um, Europeans like to come here in the summer. We, we found that it, um, our nonstop flight uh, to and from Dubai was very, very popular in the summertime because believe it or not, we are cooler than Dubai is in the summer, so they can't get relief. Um, it's just, it, it is another reevaluation and, and I feel like a ping pong ball. It's not even a pivot, I feel like a ping pong ball. Um, or, or a thermometer, one day I'm up, one day I'm down. One day everything's going, you know, okay, we're going to start doing it. And then the next day it's stalled or stopped. Um, it's. Yeah, it it's a lot. It's right? I say it's a lot. So it what do you do? I mean, I know we're all, you know, we were talking a little bit before we came on here. You know, one of the things that I've really been trying to do, and, and I'm not as consistent as I should be, but is to find a way to do some exercise. What do you do, right, um, as, as a leader who's, who has such responsibility, um, what do you do to keep yourself sane through all this and just, you know, keep going? <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a geek. I am. Uh, I, I walk every day. I only, I, by the way, since this pandemic, have I really found the time to get outside in the fresh air or what's really like a steam bath. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Is, but I walk for about an hour, stick my AirPods in. I do listen to a lot of political podcasts, but I also listen to historical podcasts. Interestingly enough, right now I'm listening. I started about a month ago or six weeks ago listening to the history of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and with what's going on these days and with it being in the forefront, it's become a lot more relevant. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do, and I watch a lot of Netflix. I got to tell you, I think I'm almost caught up on my list. <laughs> I finished Ozark season three last night and my mind is blown. I'm almost I'm I'm almost done with season two and then and then I'm done with Netflix. I don't have any more shows. Um, <laughs> no, I've got um, Pose season two still to watch and something else just dropped recently. But I do I I I like to I like TV and TV yeah. and it gets my head out of where it, because right. if you turn TV on, right. not Netflix or or Hulu or you're, all you're listening to, it's the same it. Right. It's the coronavirus, and while it's clearly the most important issue we're dealing with from a public health perspective these days, everybody needs to take a break. And I think we women, we're so afraid to show vulnerability 
And the truth is that we are as vulnerable as anyone else. Um, and we are usually torn in more different directions than our uh, than, than our, the men in our lives are. And we have to admit that we're exhausted and we have to admit we're vulnerable. And it's not a weakness to ask for help. It's actually a strength. It took me some time to get there in my life, but we have to do that. Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more. And, and you know, I think as, as a leader, so we have 24 employees. I think one of the things, I, I like to think that one of the things that has helped them is by me being authentic about, you know, yeah, am I fearful during this time? Absolutely. Am I, you know, exhausted from dealing with the change and with, with the stress of it all? Absolutely. So while I want to be strong for them, right, it's finding that balance between letting them know that you're human, but also letting them know that regardless, you got their back and we're going to get through this right mm -hmm. together. And so I think that's, that's a huge thing, especially like you said, as women. And I think it's, as women, sometimes we need to, right? We, we feel sometimes like we have to prove mm -hmm. our, our value and our worth and, and that we belong at the table. And so we've been brought up to, to think that if we show our vulnerability, that people might not think we belong at that table. But I don't think that's true anymore today. And I'm, I'm thrilled that that's changing. Okay. But I want to yeah, and and but I want to talk a little bit about Stacy now. And you know, you've had an amazing career, um, and uh, from you know the state politics to county politics, and now to uh, the convention uh, and visitors bureau. And so, Tip, what did you always know you wanted to be in politics? Like, how did you? And I know my path was like this. Nobody's path is ever like this. I don't think. What was what was it that got you on that path? It's funny because um, I I never I, I was oh, in high school I was interested in politics. I remember um, watching growing up. The TV was always on when we had dinner, and it was the Nixon era, and the Vietnam War was raging, and my father would yell at the television and curse at Nixon, you know. And and I remember it became political at that at that at that really young age of 12 and 13. But um, I was the kid who wasn't, who wasn't invited to the senior prom. I mean, I was a wallflower. Nobody would have looked at Stacy Portner back then and said, oh yeah, Stacy's gonna be you know, elected one day because Stacy couldn't open her mouth. I mean, two words would barely come out of my mouth. Um, so it took me a while to grow into who Stacy Ritter is today. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I, I always laugh, you know, I'm, I'm Facebook friends with some of my high school friends. I went to high school here. And, I don't, they don't, I think that sometimes they read my stuff and they go, I don't remember that girl at all. Um, so it took some turns. I, I went to, I'd always wanted to be a lawyer. So I went to law school, practiced law for a few years. Didn't like it. Never didn't. When I went to, when I went to law school, LA law was the number one TV show. And I was going to have the corner office on Biscayne Boulevard. And I was going to, you know, be the big powerful. And I ended up in the law library for two years writing someone else's stuff. And it just never clicked with me. Um, so I decided to go into community service, community activism. National Council of Jewish Women was my was my pet um, organization. I became president of the local chapter, and, and they're very advocacy oriented, and that's what I liked was advocacy. We would go to Tallahassee every year. We would think we were big, you know. We knew what we were doing, walking the halls in Tallahassee, and um, one day in April of 1996. Um, my predecessor in the state legislature retired right then and there. And Steve Geller, now a county commissioner, yep. now vice mayor, looked at me and said, he knew me from national council. He said, you know what? You'd be good in that. You should run for that seat. That seat's you. So I don't, to this day, Steve and I are still friends. In fact, um, he and my husband were college roommates. So we've known him a long time. And I don't know whether to thank him or curse him, <laughs> but um, I credit or blame Steve Geller for the start. And, and I wasn't supposed to win. I was an underdog. I, I ran against someone who was already elected to the school board. She'd been elected twice. I was an underdog. Nobody knew who I was. Uh, people said I was crazy. I should wait my turn. It wasn't my time. Put some more years in. Um, and I just said, you know what? If I win, that's great. And if I lose, then I lose. And I'm doing this. And you can't tell me it's my turn. I'm not waiting my turn. And I won. Wow. And that launched a memorable career. <laughs> One 
I honestly never, never thought, ever thought that I would, uh, that I would achieve. Yeah. Eight years in the state house, almost 10 years on the county commission. And then um, I, um, I knew that it was time to leave the county commission. I was getting angry and bitter in public service and you shouldn't serve if you're angry or bitter. Yeah. And um, same conversation seemed to come up every Tuesday at the meetings and nothing would get done fast enough. And um, I was very lucky that my boss, Bertha Henry, the county administrator, uh, allowed me to get out on my own terms and yeah. appointed me to this position over four years ago. That's amazing. So, so you weren't supposed to win that election. What do you think it was? Stacy, what what was it that you think led to the success of that? Because I think, you know, that's just one example of of how you've achieved success all along. But starting from that point, what were some of the ingredients to that? I I've got <laughs> luck. There's some luck. Uh, my uh, my opponent took me for granted. Mm. He, I was a buddy, so she didn't think I I would win and or would would even compete. <laughs> And I remember it was a 10 week campaign. I didn't announce until June for a September primary. I walked the district every day, eight hours a day, seven days a week. I never gave up. I never stopped walking. The newspapers didn't endorse me. Neither the Herald nor the Sun Sentinel endorsed me my first, uh, my first election. I remember calling my campaign manager crying. He said, you know what? You get your butt out there. You start knocking on doors. I'm telling you, nobody cares. And I did, and nobody said to me, oh no, I can't vote for you. You didn't get endorsed by the newspapers. I worked harder than my opponent did. Um, and that was really what, it was hard work. We put, I, I was very lucky. I, I fell into a very good team um, as well, but, um, and I had a lot to work with, if I do say so. Uh, but um, it was hard, hard work. And there were days when I wanted to just what am I doing? I don't belong here. Nobody knows who I am. My opponent is well known. She has more money than I do. Who, who do I think I am to do this? And I just kept telling, they just kept telling me, put your head down. My campaign manager famously said, do what I tell you to do, go where I tell you to go, say what I tell you to say. Didn't know any better. But my reelection campaign didn't work that way. I told them what to do, but um, I just worked harder. I did, I worked harder. and. What I learned was it, hard work really does, it really does matter. Yeah. So I, I start to write down the ingredients and some of the things that you've mentioned, I think are, are so critical to, to your recipe. You know, and of course you talked about being grateful and showing vulnerability, right? And being authentic as, as a leader and as a woman, um, not being afraid to ask for help, right? And that does sometimes for strong women, uh, that's a tough one sometimes, right? It takes us a long time to get there because we see it as a sign of weakness when it's really not. Um, and then growing into, I love it because I think our young women today see us in, in positions that we're in, especially you, and they think, you know, you started there, right? And so they don't know that you grew into, right, who you are today and the leader that you are today. So I think always remembering that, we don't start out a certain way, but that we continue to learn and grow. And you talked about being a geek, but what I hear is someone who is always wanting to learn and grow um, and expand their horizons. It's so important. Um, I love that you put a little bit of luck in there. Oh, yeah. I think that's important. Never get complacent. You mentioned that about us as a county with, this, with the virus, and then you also mentioned it also in your campaign, right? And never... Um, getting, thinking that, you know, we got this, right? And then I love this one, working harder than your opponent. I love that one uh, because we can work hard, but if somebody else working hard too, right, then somebody's going to have to work harder to get where they got to get. So I love that one. Never giving up, uh, having a great team. And what I heard at the end there was even when there's doubt and fear in your mind and in your heart, keep pushing through it. Right. And you seem to have done that. Um, I think it's it's really interesting. It was there for me. There was a woman in my life many years ago who was a huge influence, of course, besides my mom, who was an amazing role model 
but there was some, and who always pushes me. I mean, I'll walk in my mother's house and she'll be like, you need to go on a diet. You know I mean? My mom never ever sugarcoated anything. She told you like it was, um, but she meant it in, in the kindest of ways to help you. But, but, and, and so I've just come to know that that's okay. Right. Um, I'd rather somebody be straightforward, but there was a woman in my life who really did push me for you. Was there uh, someone in your life, a mentor, man or woman, um, who helped you become who you are today? I um, I had a couple of teachers who really, even to this day, uh, I communicate with. Um, one of them was my high school history teacher, Dave Gordon. Um, so uh, I'll make sure that I let him know I dropped his name. He was <laughs> a huge influence on me in high school. Um, taught me about being inquisitive and never taking anything at face value, but doing your own research. Of course, this was the days of the Dewey Decimal System and the card catalog. So research was a lot harder back then, but um, he did. And then I had a, a professor, two professors in, in, um, in college, one of whom has passed away, unfortunately, who also saw something that I don't think I even saw in me. Uh, I know I didn't see in me. Saw something in me that I didn't know was there, that they fostered and mentored and paid attention. And we're not talking, I mean, I was not a stellar student. I was, you know, a B student in college. Um, and so it wasn't that they were fostering what they thought was this great intellect, but there was something, something. And um, I, I carry those three, Dr. Carson, Dr. O'Sullivan, and Mr. Gordon with me, I call, I carry them with me every single day. Mm, that's powerful. Yeah. I think that the power of mentors and teachers, right, on our lives is so important. I think that's why I love what, what we do at Junior Achievement, because we, we engage with people just like you who inspire and share their stories with our students, right, and the skills that help them to be successful. Um, and they need to hear that. They need to know that they can do it too, right? And that they're hope. And that maybe, and I'm like you, I was a B student. I was not, you know, the, the valedictorian or the summa cum laude, even though my father used to call me that. But, um, <laughs> but, but you know what? It's okay. You can still be uh, successful and, and be happy. And, but what I think I love most about watching you in this role, um, you seem so happy in this role. <laughs> I am. What is why is that? Why are do you even with things as as you know as stressful as they are, you still really seem happy. It, <laughs> well, I get a bit, I'm glad. I'm glad that that comes through. Um, I am. I'm. I have. I am so thrilled to be able to finish my career here. Hopefully, finish it here. Um, it's, I feel, I feel, I think we're making a bigger impact on my, on the community than I ever did when I was elected official. I think we did some pretty great things when I was on the county commission. Um, the airport, we, we, built, we built the runway, we built the courthouse, we put people to work in 09. But I, I, I think that we're, we, we are more relevant to the community as a CPD than, than I was when I was an elected official. And the ability, I've lived here since 1974. Um, I've watched this place grow into this this vibrant, thriving, diverse, inclusive, and welcoming destination. Um, my hometown has. When I moved here, everything was everybody was white and male. To get to get along, you had to be a white, straight male. And the fact that it's changed, and I get to tell that story around the world to people about how diverse and inclusive and welcoming we are that we are, a, we are the true melting pot. You know, we're not like Miami where there's a little Haiti and a little hunt. Here, everybody lives together, your neighbors. Um, I, I, I've traveled the world and, I, and I, when I talk about my destination, I say to them, look, if you only wanna go to a place where you're gonna see someone who looks like you, don't come here because that's not we are. We are this, this rich, colorful fabric that we weave together in this tapestry where everybody lives in, in, and, and let and let and let let's live so let let live and let live so that's who we are and the fact that i get to talk about that the place that i've made my home 
where my children are born and raised, and I get to tell that story. I mean, I, when, I, when I was selling myself for the job, and that's what it was, um, it was a campaign, I didn't think there was anybody better to tell that story, and I love doing that. Uh, you can see it. Boy, you just light up about it. <laughs> and I think you're right. I mean, there, there's if, if you don't love what you do, I just can't even imagine getting through a time like this, right? Um, when you're already miserable and not happy with it. Um, and I think you're right. I mean, and I think that's what keeps me going like you is that, you know, we can make such a difference in the community for children. For me, it's always been about children and families, right? And so being able to help them because I, I do believe, look, we may not be able to change uh, the behaviors and the philosophies and the beliefs of, of adults, right? But we can mold the next generation and prepare them, right, to be the next people who take over from, from all of us. And so that really inspires me. And I know that, that that's, that's amazing to hear. So I always ask this question before we close, and that is, so you mentioned all those amazing ingredients. And I love, by the way, how you talked about Broward as a tapestry um, and, and such a diverse, inclusive um, community. What is the main ingredient to Stacy Ritter's success? <laughs> I know everybody hates this question. They're like, just one? One ingredient. I, I don't think I'm an A-type personality. I think I know how to relax and chill and have a good time. But um, I think that, and I came to this later in life than I hope the younger generation of women do. I hope that they find it in their 20s and 30s and not when I did in my 40s. But I, I'm, I'm driven. I am. I'm driven. I'm driven to make this, this is going to sound so corny. But I, first of all, I do want to leave a mark. That's my own ego talking. But I want to leave a mark that shows that it's a better place than it was when mm. before. Um, and that's and that's what drives me, making this place better than it was before. Um, but there are a lot of tangential things too. I mean, you know, there's a bunch of stuff. Uh, of course, a desire and a drive to just make life better for the next generation. And and as I said, I do hope that the young women. One of the things I hope that women in particular. I was asked this question once, you know, about help in my in my career, and I've been helped more by men than I ever have been by women in my career. Mm. That's got to change. Yeah. Men help men all the time. Women, you know, the pie the pie is big enough for all of us. Your slice may be different than mine, but that doesn't mean that you're not getting your equitable slice. And I mm. and I hope that if there's one thing I'm mentoring the younger women in my office about is, you know, lend that hand up. Don't. Don't make the ladder harder to climb, make it easier to climb. That's such a good point. Yeah, such a good point that sometimes we don't help each other and lift each other up. And, and I've heard that before. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in our uh, organization of 24 full timers right now, which is where we are, only two are men. And so it's really been a, a focus of mine to create that uplifting because we have got to help each other through this as mothers as women as wives or significant others or whatever your story might be we have to have to help each other but but i love that i i think you know and, and you said about ego but i don't know stacy leaving a legacy is not always about ego i i also hear a true passion for wanting to leave things better and i don't think that's ego Right? Oh, maybe sometimes we want a little credit for it. That's our ego, right? But uh, we know, and maybe noticeable, you know, notable mention here or there. That's our ego. But I think your drive to want to make things better and leave things better, that legacy, I think that's pretty genuine, at least as long as I've known you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Same to you. Same to you. It's, it's well, thank you. I put on makeup for you. I know you did. I'm so grateful. I feel so privileged. I blew my hair dressed. <laughs> From the waist up. Anyway, we don't know what's going on. But anyway, <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you for opening up um, with me and, and for our viewers. And it, I mean, just 
hearing your story. And like I said, I have always watched you, right? I've always been on the other side of the county commission, uh, when is when I, which is when I got to know you even better. Um, and so I, and probably I, there was a little bit of fear in there uh, too. Um, I hope I'm yeah. I've it was wanted. very intimidating, very intimidating. Um, but, but I, you know, I, I've been called that too. Yes, There's, you are. <laughs> hey, I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult, but <laughs> I, I think intimidating is not a bad thing. Yeah, but I, but I think when, no matter what, no matter how strong, no matter how influential, and all of those things, that when someone cares, it comes through. And so I see that in you, and that's why I was never really afraid. <laughs> to approach you and come talk to you. Um, and so thank you for always being there for me. Thank you for everything that you do for this community, not just the community and the people in need, but for all of us, because without you and your organization, right, Broward would not be the thriving community that it is. And I know under your leadership that we're going to get through this and you're going to take us to new heights um, because big plans, I know, uh, will be on the horizon. So Thank you for your thank leadership. You. Thank, thank you, you for your thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for watching. And we look forward to seeing you on our ne next episode of Jay's Recipe for Success. Let's get cooking. <laughs>